decision making in laser and refractive surgery. I will start with the preoperative workup. The preoperative workup consists of history taking, examination, and investigations. But before that, we have to know that a good candidate for refractive surgery is capable of understanding the risks of the procedures, is able to follow instructions, is able to be available for post-operative follow-up, and has good personal characteristics such as easygoing and positive outlook. And at the same time, a good surgeon should avoid making grandiose statements, discuss the expectations with the patient, mention the enhancement rate and reasons for that, and tell the patient that the surgery is elective. Starting with the history taking. History taking consists of social and occupational, ocular, general, and family. The social and occupational consists of asking the patient four questions, age, occupation, demands and expectations, and activities. I'll give you some examples. A highly myopic jeweler who is used to examining objects without glasses a few inches from the eyes may not be happy with the post-operative emetropia, while soldiers, firefighters, or police may require that their best vision to be at a specific distance and may have restrictions on the type of refractive surgery they can have. In addition, some types of sports with high risk of ocular trauma may have some restrictions on the type of refractive surgery, especially for LASIK. In such cases, surface ablation or smile may be preferable to LASIK. Ocular history taking. It consists of refractive history, contact lenses, dry eye syndrome, hyperlacrimation, chronic allergy, ocular trauma, previous surgeries, and glaucoma. Starting with the refractive history, we have to know the onset of the refractive error. If it started around puberty, we should think of keratoconus. If it started after age of 30, we should think of pellucid marginal generation. And if it started after the age of 50, then we have to think of nuclear sclerosis and nuclear cataract. The stability of the refractive error. The refractive error can be considered as stable if the changes were less than 0.5 diopters over one year. Regarding the anisometropia, if there is anisometropia, we have to suspect ectotic corneal diseases. In addition, there is a risk of developing diplopia after refractive surgery in case of preoperative anisometropia due to muscular imbalance. So in this case, we have to give the patient a chance of contact lens trial before making the decision. If the patient in the presbiopic age, presbyopia after the treatment should be discussed with the patient, especially with myopic patients. And the development of early presbyopia in case of high myopic patients in late 30s as well should be discussed with the patient. Now, the solution of monovision should be discussed as well. The mini monovision, uh, which is leaving minus 0.75 diopters in the non-dominant eye, monovision, which is leaving minus 1.5 diopters, and the uh, gross monovision, which is leaving minus 2.5. But usually, the gross monovision is not accepted and the patients are not comfortable with. So the most popular is the mini monovision and monovision. However, in all cases, a chance of contact lens trial should be given to the patient before making the decision. Contact lenses. Contact lenses should be stopped at least for one week before doing any examination. Why? Because they are a main source for irregular astigmatism and hot spots formation on the corneal tomography. They affect the amount and access of astigmatism and can alter corneal thickness. Dry eye syndrome may affect topography, may affect refraction, may change K readings, and may change corneal thickness. So dry eye syndrome should be treated sufficiently for a sufficient period before doing any exam. Hyperlacrimation affects topography, affects refraction, is a major cause for diffuse lamellar keratitis after LASIK, and is a major cause for infection after any refractive surgery. Chronic allergy. There is a strong relationship between constant rubbing and keratoconus development, LASIK flap complications, post-op infections, ICR complications, intracorneal ring complications, and corneal cross-linking failure. 
ocular trauma. Ocular trauma may be the source of retinal tears, optic nerve atrophy, corneal opacities and scars, iridogenesis, and then subluxation. We have to ask about previous surgeries. If the patient had laser vision correction, this may explain the high order abrasions that the patient is suffering from, and we can avoid surgical surprises, for example, if we are doing enhancement by PRK over a previous LASIK flap, and we can avoid IOL miscalculations. In case of a previous cataract surgery, we have to know the date of the surgery and the type of the implanted IOL. The date of the surgery is important because we have to leave at least three months after FACO and six months after the ECCE before doing any uh, additional treatment. And the time for the IOL may affect the decision, especially if the IOL was a premium lens, such as toric lenses and multifocal lenses. In case of a retinal surgery, previous retinal surgery, if it was by doing a buckle, we have to know that the buckle may interfere with the application of the suction ring. And if there is silicon oil inside the eye, the silicon oil will change the refractive index and there will be miscalculations. In addition, the conjunctival scars may interfere with the application of the suction ring. And in case of a previous squint surgery, there might be the risk of post-operative decompensation because of muscular imbalance after refractive surgery. And conjunctival scars may interfere with the application of the suction ring. If there was a pterygium surgery, then this may explain the irregular astigmatism that the patient is suffering from. The patient should understand the uh, possibility of recurrence of the pterygium, uh, which may affect the outcomes of the refractive surgery. And we have to pay attention that the conjunctival scars may interfere with the application of the suction ring. If the patient has glaucoma, refractive surgery is contraindicated in case of an existing optic neuropathy. In addition, LASIK should be discussed versus SMILE versus surface ablation because in LASIK and SMILE, because of the application of the suction ring, the IOP will be raised and this may predispose the eye to more optic neuropathy. On the other hand, doing surface ablation predisposes the eye to uh, increased IOP due to using steroids for a long period after the operation. And don't forget that, in case of a blip, there will be an interference with the suction ring application. General history taking. General history taking consists of asking about diabetes, hypertension, allergy and atopic diseases, collagen vascular diseases, keloid formation, pregnancy and nursing, immunodeficiency syndromes and diseases, medications and some other conditions. The uncontrolled diabetes affects the outcomes of the refractive surgery because of the unstable refraction, poor epithelial healing, the risk of development of cataract and retinal problems. In addition, multifocal IOLs cannot be used in case of diabetes. Uncontrolled and malignant hypertension is contraindication for refractive surgery. The allergic and atopic diseases predisposed to preoperative dryness, postoperative complications because of constant throbbing like flap complications and intracorneal ring complications, and predisposed for post-op ectasia development and cross-linking failure. Collagen vascular diseases such as systemic lupus erythematous, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, hyperthyroidism and Crohn disease all affect wound healing and may lead to corneal melting in addition to treatment side effects such as cataract infections and glaucoma. Diseases with keloid formation. Those diseases include dysosteosis, Ehlers-Danlos, Marfan and sclerosis. It has been shown that such diseases are not contraindications for refractive surgery. Pregnancy and nursing affect refraction status, corneal topography, K readings, and corneal thickness. Therefore, we have to leave 6 to 12 weeks after nursing before proceeding with the refractive surgery. 
In addition, if there is a plan for pregnancy, then it should be 6 to 12 months after refractive surgery. Immunodeficiency diseases predispose to infections. Medications. Some medications have an adverse effect on refractive surgery, such as anticoagulants, isotrentoine or ricotain, amiodarone, hormone replacement therapy, antihistamines, immunosuppressants, and somatriptine. The anticoagulants predispose to conjunctival hemorrhage during application of the suction ring. In addition to expulsive choroidal hemorrhage during intraocular refractive surgery. The isotrentoine or ricotain predisposed to poor epithelial healing and lack of tear production. So this medication should be stopped at least six months before proceeding with laser refractive surgery. In addition, the amiodarone hormone replacement therapy and antihistamines predisposed to poor epithelial healing. Immunosuppressants predisposed to infection, and the somatriptine predisposes to vein occlusion during suction application. So, this medication should be stopped at least one month before doing LASIK or SMILE technique. Other conditions they include cardiac pacemakers and implanted defibrillators. They may interfere with the magnetic field of the eczema laser and the femtosecond laser. In case of epilepsy, there must be at least 12 months of quiet disease before proceeding with any refractive surgery. And in case of history of frequent fainting, the patient should be prepared before going for any surgery. If the patient has hepatitis B or C, protective measures should be taken to avoid any transmission to the staff. Family history, it includes asking about keratoconus and other ectoconal diseases, glaucoma, steroids, hypersensitivity, corneal dystrophy or degenerations, and retinal pathology. Examination. The examination should be done in the following steps and in the following order. Visual acuity. We have to determine the visual acuity at all distances, far, intermediate, and near. Clinical refraction. Manifest refraction and cycloplegic refraction both should be done for every patient, even with a small amount of myopia. And in case of a significant difference between the manifest refraction and cycloplegic refraction, which is more than one diopter, then a further test should be done, which is the PMT or the postpedritic test. We have to pay attention to the anatomy of the orbit and the eye. Why? Because if the patient has small set eyes, deep set eyes, prominent eyebrows, prominent nasal bridge. This may interfere with the application of the suction ring and femtosecond, smile technique, and LASIK, and the speculum in case of intraocular refractive surgery. Ocular motility should be checked and should be examined very carefully in order to exclude any tropia or phoria and to prevent having decompensation after any refractive surgery. The, the non-dominant eye should be determined in case of monovision plan. Pupillometry is very important for two reasons. To determine the optical zone in laser vision correction and to avoid any undesired symptoms after premium lens implantation. External examination and slit lamp biomicroscopy are very important to exclude any pathologies in the anterior segment, crystal lens, and anterior vitreous. Tear film tests. The basic tests that should be done for every patient are Schirmer test and the BUT. And in case of abnormality, further tests should be done, such as fluorescein clearance test, osmolarity, and cytology. Finally, IOP should be measured before doing the dilated fundus exam. The dilated fundus exam is mandatory for every patient. Investigations. The investigations differ based on the type of refractive surgery. However, the very basic investigation that should be done in all cases is corneal topography and corneal tomography. 
corneal and ocular wavefront can be done in case of some complaints of the patient, such as glare, halos, starbursts, shadows, and in case of irregular astigmatism, and in case of non-optimum visual acuity. Endothelial cell count is mandatory for all cases of intraocular refractive surgery. White to white or sulcus to sulcus measurement is very important not only for fake IOL implantation, but also for the IOL implantation in case of extreme sizes of the globe. For example, the very small globe or the very large globe to avoid any displacement of the intraocular lens or shallow anterior chamber and the development of ankle closure glaucoma. A scan is very important, especially in cases of an isometropia. IOL measurements, anterior OCT. The anterior OCT is important in the detection of the pre-stage of keratoconus by the epithelial mapping. In addition, the anterior OCT is very important for planning, especially in case of haze or scars. We have to know that in case of haze of scars, tomography will not be as accurate as the anterior OCT because of light scattering. Finally, corneal biomechanics, if available, in order to exclude those corneas that are prone to develop ectasia after keratorefractive surgery. Thank you very much.